And good evening and welcome to tonight's program, Monarch Butterflies, Their Magic, Revealed Secrets, and Our Part with Serene Slagona. I'm Brenda Harrington, Program Librarian at the Belfast Free Library. I want to thank you all for joining us. I'd also like to thank our co-sponsor for tonight's program, the Belfast Bay Watershed Coalition. The Belfast Free Library has been co-hosting BBWC evening programs on Zoom since 2020. It's been a fun and really successful collaboration and I've really appreciated being able to do this. Before I turn the mic over to Jean Randall, treasurer for, for the Belfast Bay Watershed Coalition for updates and to introduce tonight's speaker, I want to remind everyone that to please keep your mics muted. And if you have any questions during the talk, please enter them in the chat and we will answer them at the end. The program is being recorded and will be available on the library's YouTube channel. And with that, I will turn the mic over to Jean Randall. All right, Jean. Oh, thank you, Brenda. I want to welcome everybody from, on behalf of the board of BBWC to tonight's program on Monarch Butterf Butterflies presented by Serene Sigalona. But first, a couple of messages just to make sure we're, we stay in touch with everybody. We encourage everyone to check our newsletter and follow us on Facebook and uh, check our website out for upcoming programs and events because we're getting ready to get into a very active season here. Summer's coming, believe it or not. Anyway, next month on April 21st, there'll be another Zoom presentation. Uh, to our middle school. middle school has a wonderful garden and David Russell's is gonna tell us all about it. And then on April 9th uh, will be our last bird watch on the walking bridge. So uh, if you haven't tried that, uh, it's a lot of fun. We talked to uh, a lot of very knowledgeable people on the uh, uh, bridge and uh, see a lot of different species of birds. And then of course the Earth Day activities begin on April 22nd. Uh, we're real pleased to know, announce that uh, Tom King, in conjunction with the uh, Fish Fins program, delivered 2,400 Atlantic salmon eggs to 11 different local schools last week. These eggs will be raised to the fry stage by the students and then released by the students into Westcott Stream sometime in May when they get just to be the right size. Tonight's program about monarch butterflies by Serene Sigalona. Uh, Serene is a retired educator, studied monarch butterflies since childhood. She's a Maine master naturalist. She belongs to the Maine Entomological Society and has made presentations to elementary and middle school children, all the senior colleges in Belfast and Augusta, many other locations throughout the state. And Serene even has visited a overwintering site. I assume, Marie, uh, Serene, you can tell us about that. I probably was in Mexico, but uh, it, the, the bio didn't say that. I'm just guessing. But at any rate, she continues to rear and release monarchs. So Serene, take it away. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for everyone who's come. Hello, Jane in Arizona. And um, I'm going to begin. I hope this goes, I trust it will go smoothly. Yes, yes, we see half, only see half a screen. And now. There we go. <clears throat> we've got it, correct? Yes. Okay, okay thank you. Um, I. All right, press the wrong button. Well, Jean's already taken care of this. I wanted to share what my background was. And um, my point in doing this is I have an avid interest in monarchs and the web of life that is created through, um, through them, with them. Um, I'm not a professional, but I, uh, a professional entomologist, but I, uh, have been a teacher and once a teacher always a teacher um and yes my two migrations were to michoacan mexico at the overwintering sites what i'd like to share with you um, is where i get my information there are three sources primarily 
the first one and my guru, uh, you could say, is Chip Taylor. He founded um, Monarch Watch as a professor in the Department of Ecology uh, at the University of Kansas at Lawrence. Um, Monarch Joint Venture is a nonprofit organization that has built, um, it is an umbrella organization that has built a national partnership of a vast variety of agencies and organizations, um, all with the working together to conserve monarch butterflies in particular, and of course, other pollinators. And I won't try to pronounce the, the third name, um, but uh, as a professor at Cornell University, he has been a major researcher into monarchs and is the author of one of my favorite books, Monarchs and Milkweed, um, a book that explores the relationship between this poisonous plant, milkweed, and this butterfly, and how they um, interact with each other, and again, the world around them. In honor of National International Women's Day, which has just passed, I'd like to start the presentation with, um, with this image. And I don't know how many of you recognize this. It certainly is famous in the monarch world. Uh, the National Geographic issue, August 1976, discovered the monarch's Mexican haven. And in the article, very little acknowledgement is given to this young woman. Well, Kathy is a native of the state of Michoacan, Mexico where indeed the overwintering sites are. And in um, 1972, she was given a, a, a notice by Fred and Nora Urquhart, who were Canadian entomologists who knew that the monarchs migrated south from Canada, um, but they had no idea where the monarchs went to. So they were asking for volunteers to hunt for the, for the butterflies in Mexico. Um, she and her eventual husband, photographer, um, took on the challenge. They researched clues, talked to people. They hiked, did a lot of hiking in the higher mountains of Michoacan, which is primarily a volcanic ridge. Um, and in January, on January 2nd, 1975, they found this large population of, in, of Sierra Leone where trees and the grounds were covered, blanketed with millions of monarch butterflies. On the ninth, they called the Urquhart's and the rest is history. So this is, this is yet another one of the photographs that, that her soon to be husband took. So Kathy is, is finally getting her, her due credit Another woman I'd like to share with you is uh, Sarah Dykeman. Sarah took on the challenge that she created for herself. She built a bike um, and um, equipment that carried her more than 10,000 miles through Canada, the United States, and Mexico. And her purpose was to educate people on the beauty and the uh, nature of the monarch migration. And she has, uh, in the book, there are quite a few stories that she shares, some of the interesting ones being the bar patrons who didn't quite believe what this young woman was doing in their town late at night, um, border officials who were not impressed with her at all when she said she was dealing with butterflies and so on. Anyway, it's an enjoyable read lots of good photographs. So where are we now? And excuse me, I'm going to close the door. Where are the monarchs right now and what are they doing? Well, we're approaching the March equinox. And in mid-March, the temperatures at the, sanct at the sanctuaries, the overwintering sites, 
can get as high as um, 79 degrees Fahrenheit. It's quite warm. Uh, and the monarchs are beginning to leave the OML forests and they're on the move north. And this was an update um, as of today from uh, Journey North. The monarchs over winter in sites that are located on 12 mountain tops uh, in Mexico's trans uh, volcanic belt. The sites are also home to a rare and endangered tree, the OML fir tree. Um, it grows at altitudes between 2,400, 3,600 meters. And compare that to Mount Batty in our beloved um, Camden Hills State Park uh, of 238 meters. This um, is uh, from the uh, Monarch uh, Watch uh, list from Kansas, um, University of Kansas. Um, CHIP monitors the monarchs on a daily basis. Um, the monarchs are late. The migration has not quite started. And he goes to iNaturalist, which I hope you all know, and uh, Journey North, which if you don't know, please do check it out. Uh, for evidence that monarchs uh, have that overwintered in Mexico have reached Texas. And he says it's not happening. Um, what he did do was he went through iNaturalist and Journey North, and he looked at the images that people were posting. And what he found that those images are of pristine butterflies. They are not butterflies that have endured overwintering in Mexico, because if they had their, their wings would have been um, faded. Uh, there would be nicks in the wings, chips and so forth. And he's not seeing that. And this is the map that he is referring to. Um, if you look here, um, I'm gonna show you an image in a minute, but these are all reported sightings. And the sightings that are of, of prime interest are the sightings that we would find here. Um, this, this is the Western population and we're going to ignore that for now. The Florida population is a, pardon me, a year round population. This is not necessarily made of monarchs that I'm saying necessarily. These are not migrating monarchs. This picture up here is really questionable. And I checked it out and I looked and uh, the woman reported or the person reported um, it, it could have been a yellow leaf that was flying through the air. They weren't sure. So this is, this is interesting, whatever, but what you want to look at down here are the, are the ones that have um, supporting information such as this. Um, when you report to to um, Journey North, here's a monarch adult sighted, which is a special category. Here's the location, this, this uh, marker pinpoints the address, how many were seen. This is where they were seen at the San Antonio Riverwalk, a butterfly garden. Again, this monarch is just pristine. It's a beautiful adult. It looks like, it almost looks like a male because of that dot right there, but the picture is quite small. But this kind of information is available and this kind of information is sought by Journey North and iNaturalist and other organizations. What are people seeing? When are they seeing it, it and where? This is a map of um, the overwintering sites, Mexico City, a tiny little village here called Angangueo, which is at the center of the, um, of the wintering sites. This scale here is 20 miles. And you can see that it's a very small distance uh, where the monarchs are located. So here is, um, here is the site. About here is Mexico City. And they've got to get themselves all the way up here before they begin to cross the border into Texas. Here we are on the, um, if you've 
seen any of my presentations before. This is a um, the cycle, uh, a good image of the cycle of the of the um, migration. So we're about here. All right. Um, they have not begun uh, going north, and egg laying has not begun in any recognizable, noticeable numbers. But it it will it will because it has for so many so many many years. What are the problems that the monarchs are facing? Well, one of the big problems that I'll talk the most about is climate and the effects of climate change. Optimal conditions, I'm, I'm just going to breeze through this quickly, but this is about what are the optimal conditions um, for the, the butterflies, the monarch butterflies. Um, monarchs are worldwide and throughout the locations in the world, they exhibit different types of overwintering and migratory behaviors. But the biggest migration, the most famous migration, and the one that we're trying to protect and preserve is the one in North America, where the butterflies, where a butterfly um, that weighs a fifth of a penny travels 200, uh, 2,500 miles uh, from a location, let's say in Canada, to a place they've never been to in Mexico. Um, they go to the locations in Michoacan, which provide them with a very unique microclimate, a microclimate that is being threatened because of climate change, because the OML trees require certain temperatures, um, a certain amount of sunlight to, to, to grow, to exist, and, and that is threatened. Um, what is happening is, in, especially in uh, El Rosario, there is a nursery there for the Oyamel uh, trees. And so when you enter the sanctuary, uh, you'll see off to the left, a large area where there are Oyamel plugs that are being planted further and further up the mountains. Um, to make sure that the, the monarchs have a safe haven in the winter. Um, the Western monarchs also migrate, but they fly from inland to coastal overwintering groves that are very different, but they also have a specific microclimate. There are fewer monarchs in the Western population, and in fact, last year, there was the notion of calling them an extinct group at that point because the numbers had dropped so low. But for some reason, this past season, their numbers jumped. No one understands why. Everyone is quite grateful. Um, the, there are fewer monarchs in the Western population, but they spread um, out among hundreds of overwintering sites, whereas the millions of monarchs that are on the eastern, uh, that are part of the eastern population, go to fewer than 20 sites in Mexico. That's why when you're there, there is this overwhelming presence of life up in the trees. And I'm smiling to myself because one of the people that's here uh, in the group, um, Jane, and I were there together. Um, so, and the, the other difference with the Western um, population compared to the, what they call the Eastern population is there is a shorter diapause, which is the period of time where the, the, the animal um, is sexually inactive. That has changed for those, for the ones in, in Mexico now, of course, and it has been changed for about almost a month. Threats. Uh, okay, this is between 1975 and 2020. The rate of temperature increase in Fahrenheit um, in the United States. 
the, the West is being devastated. We have some very serious conditions here on the East Coast. Um, but the temperature has been changing. This is a reasonable area where it's been, the temperatures are quite moderate, um, but elsewhere things are changing and that's of concern. Of course, not just for monarchs, but that's who we're talking about tonight. Listening to a talk by, by Chip Taylor um, about a month ago, his major point was when was the last time CO2 levels were as high as they are now on earth? The last time was during the Pleistocene epoch, five plus to two, almost three million years ago. Sea levels were an estimated 50 feet higher than there are, they are today. And forests grew as far north as the Arctic. So we're facing change. Another map. This is um, where the monarchs are coming from or coming from that end up in the oil forest. You can see the majority of the butterflies are coming from this area, 12%, 38%, 11%, over 50% of the butterflies come through here. But please pay attention to this group right here. That's our 15%. And I don't know what Maine is broken down to, but these are critical numbers here. These butterflies can help make up for any losses that are encountered in the, the mid flyway. This arrow, by the way, does not indicate how those butterflies get to Mexico. They do not fly out over the ocean. They hug the coast. And if I can point it out here, I think it's covered. Uh, I believe it's here, Cape May, New Jersey. Uh, one of the major jumping off points. So our butterflies from Maine, Connecticut, Massachusetts are going to head down through here. They have jumping off points where they gather for the prime weather conditions for them to take flight and go over the water, head over the water and head across down. The journey starts in mid-August and ends um, on ends for most butterflies around November 1st. Climate change, well, weather, rainfall, storms, snow at the wintering sites are all threats to the viability of the population. Climate also um, affects um, plants. And there is a concern about the changes in milkweed, the toxic toxicity level um, of the cardinaloids in the milkweed um, have the potential to increase. And monarchs have a preference for the level of toxicity in the plants. So it, the question is, could it come to a point where the milkweed that is available is considered too toxic by the butterflies, um, you know, they, they're going to have to deal with their eggs at some point, but if the milkweed isn't there that they prefer, what's going to happen? There's also the availability of milkweed. Um, different varieties of milkweed need different growing conditions. And if those conditions change, what happens then? This is, um, again, a well-shared um, bar graph of the total area occupied by monarch colonies in Mexico. And you can see in 96, 97, there was, excuse me. There we are. Um, There was a, a large population here. And then from 96, 97, it has just steadily, steadily decreased. 
this was a real warning signal, 2004, uh, 2004. Here, we started with a serious decline. It perked up, but then it dropped down to a, a really near catastrophic, um, less than one hectare, which is how they measure the population. And I think I'll say this now because of this point right here. Um, they, the scientists are saying, what is the number of hectares required in order to sustain the population? And it is agreed upon it's a minimum of, of six hectares. And you can see in the last two years, we've dropped well below it. And I'm listening to myself and saying, is this a lot of gloom and doom? I don't think so. What it is, is reality that we're dealing with. And there are things that we can help to do to address what's going on. Well, now I'll get into the gloomy stuff again for a minute. Um, Quasi-extinction. Quasi-extinction means when you've got a population, but it's so small that, that, the pop, that the species is doomed, even if there are individuals alive. Pardon me, the Western population, the worst scenario is within 60 years, we will have lost the Western population. Eastern population, um, By 2075, we are, at, we are at serious risk. Certainly not with the Western population, but, but seriously threatened here. And by the way, the Western population and the Eastern population are not genetically different. It is simply their location. Okay, mating, um, begins in February through March. And the females can hold the sperm um, within their bodies after mating for fertilization um, as they head north. And then they will use that up as they lay eggs in Northern Mexico and the Southern United States. What's important for that first generation is um, the availability of good host milkweed plants coming up out of the ground being available, moderate temperatures, because when the temperatures drop too low, then the development of the egg to the larva to adult is slow. And a slow start is not beneficial for the cycle. The other is predation levels. Now, this being said, this, remember, this is each generation needs these things. The other thing that they need is good nectar sources, especially on the southern migration. Predation levels. In, in one field study um, that can be general, generalized, up to 90% of the eggs and larvae in the study area were consumed within 72 hours. Now a female monarch lays between 100 to 300 eggs. Um, and that huge number is necessary because of the mortality rate. Only 5% plus or minus of the monarch larva reach the final instar, which is when they become a chrysalis. One of the paybacks to the predators um, seems to be that wasps that prey on the larva can be sensitive to the cardinaloids that the monarchs have ingested. And um, their bodies absorb that. And they, as a result, tend to have a lower reproduction potential. They can't create the next generation and their nests are uh, abnormal. Um, so again, this might be 
a reason, if you could reason with wasps, you know, to kind of lay off. Anyway, egg. Um, you're, you often hear in the literature that you look underneath the, the um, leaf of a milkweed plant to find the eggs, which you do, but they can be anywhere on the milkweed plant. Um, very small plant. This is just a plug coming up out of the ground. Um, this is a, a bud cluster, and you notice one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, possibly nine eggs there that we can see. That might be another. Um, this is usually happens when there isn't a lot of milkweed available, or the female is desperate to get rid of her eggs. And this is called the term is egg dumping. Um, an egg is shiny, uh, dome, pointed dome shape. Um, and sometimes the female kind of misses her mark. Here's one on a larva, and here is a rather surprised aphid. Monarchs larva know that they need to avoid the latex, that is that, that milky substance that you find in the milkweed plant. And so they chew in a very direct motion. Um, they'll cut the veins before they begin to eat the, the green of the plant. Um, because if they get covered with that milk, if their face gets covered with that milk, which dries, it's very gluey, um, it's, uh, it's a death sentence. Egg, first, second, third, fourth, fifth instar, under ideal conditions, it's 10 to 18 days um, for that part of their life. Um, the 18 days would be later in the season, um, generally. First instar, the first growth spurt of the monarch eats about this much area of, of a leaf, the second, third, fourth, all the way up to the fifth instar will eat one to two leaves of this whole size in a day. That's why they're nicknamed uh, uh, the eating machine. Just two of my favorite pictures. And this is mostly how we see monarchs in Maine. Um, in the fall, we may see congregations of migrators, but most of our encounters with monarchs in Maine are, are in the larva state. Chrysalis, again, 10 to 14 days, 14 later in the season. You can see with this newly formed chrysalis that already the wings and the abdomen within hours are very obvious in the chrysalis. All of the cells within that creature are designated. They all know their part. This, in case, um, you, you are not aware the the caterpillar lays down a thread of silk wherever it goes in its, in its life. Um, and at the end, the fifth instar, it creates this silk pad, this silk net to insert its backside to, this is a cremister, and it hooks in there just like Velcro. This is exactly like this, except the color is pink because this is a queen um, butterfly. And it's my goal one day to, to see a real one. Um, I'd really like to see that color on my own. From the J to the transition, shedding the, the outer layer, the chrysalis is formed. Over time, you'll begin to see in a healthy monarch, you'll see the veins get darker, a little bit of black, you'll see the orange. And then finally, you'll hear almost a crinkle like tissue paper when the um, animal forces itself out of this layer, drops down, 
legs are already in place to hold it on. And over the next couple of hours, the fluid that remains in the body of the butterfly is forced through these veins. And then what is no longer needed is, is expelled. It takes about a, a, a day for the butterfly to, to emerge and to um, fully set itself where it, the wings become dry um, and so forth and, um, and then take wing. Uh, a lot of people who rear monarchs um, for the first time think that, well, it, it needs to go quickly. It isn't, it isn't a quick process. What is fascinating for me that I have just learned within the past couple of months is that the toxin that the monarch larva caterpillar ingests resides mostly in the wings of the butterfly. So these wings are full of the toxin as opposed to some toxin in the, in the abdomen and thorax. And you will often see, or you often can see uh, butterflies, monarchs that have little nicks in their wing and they're flying, they're fine. But what's happened is a, a bird has encountered this butterfly, thought oh, nice meal, and they somehow take a nick out of the wing or they break the wing and they know then that this is toxic. We're, we're not gonna bother with this creature here. Um, there are research papers that are hard to access, but I want to find out exactly or as much as I can about how this actually happens. Favorite cartoon. Newly emerged male and um, for some of you, I'm sorry, this is a review, but I'll go over it again. This dot on each of the hind wings is the indication of a male monarch. This is a female, the dot is not there, but what you'll see is that the veins are thicker and the female tends to be bigger. It's only been three years since research was released that what was thought to be these um, appendages that just carried the live insect are indeed alive themselves. These veins are constantly having body fluids pumped through them. The wings are, of course, essential for flight, but they also are key to the monarch being able to uh, control their temperature so that they don't overheat. Um, and um, you'll sometimes see a, a butterfly, and certainly not just monarchs, but you'll see a monarch butterfly that is, um, say, on a flower, and then it starts to vibrate its, its wings. What it's doing for its wings and the body as a whole is it's building up the um, movement throughout, it, throughout the body to take flight. Okay, this I've already talked about. Okay, second generation um, adults, they emerge in June and that's what they do. They emerge from a chrysalis, they hatch from an egg, emerge from the chrysalis. And um, again, the whole purpose of that cycle is to, to mature, become butterflies, find mates and um, pair, and then search for healthy milkweed, their only host plant. And milkweed, um, how far north do butterflies go? They will go as far north as they can sense um, the milkweed, as far as Labrador now even, 
Again, it's an impact of climate change. What is going to happen with milkweed that cannot exist in lower um, climates further down in the, in, the, in the states and migrates up north? There's only so far north that you can go. And would the monarchs that are in that last generation ever be able to make it back down to the Oyamel forest? Um, we don't know. Um, this is the second generation. And here is first generation early June, but then by the second generation, that distribution of monarchs has just spread. And that's when we're going to begin to see, um, we're going to begin to see uh, the monarchs showing up here um, late, late June, early July. The monarchs in, and it's questionable about how many generations there are. Most people agree that there are four. There could be as few as three. There could also possibly be five. So those monarchs that migrate are the great, great, great grandchildren of the monarchs that overwintered in Mexico. We still have very little to go on as to um, how that migrating generation, often called the Methuselah generation, um, uh, gets back to Mexico. And the, the Methuselah generation can, can live five months as opposed to the um, average of five to six weeks uh, that um, a monarch in the other generations lives. Again, the adults that emerge late in August undergo diapause which means they are sexually inactive and make their way to Mexico. Needing all the way um, nectaring plants. And so fall planting of flowers is really critical for not only monarchs, but in this case, we're talking about them. Certainly other, other um, animals uh, benefit from later plants. Monarchs travel great distances, 50 to 100 miles a day, um, late August to end of October. Um, it is documented that the highest recorded flight was seen with airplanes, um, 11,000 feet. And um, there's a description of monarchs in uh, Maine 100 years ago of orange blanketed the island. Um, again, you think of back to that picture with the National Geographics of the young woman standing in the forest. She was standing in the forest, but people a hundred years ago on particularly the outer islands of Maine would encounter that similar um, scene of orange everywhere. Excuse me, Serene, this is your time check. Thank you. Good. You're welcome. We're right on. I love this photograph because it's hard to see a monarch in flight. But, and again, this does not just apply to monarchs, but the butterfly's body remains horizontal while the wings move. And I still am fascinated by the fact that the the aerodynamics, the physics that enable the creature to do that. It's such an efficient flyer. Again, in Maine, you see an orange and black butterfly. Ah, oh, I'm seeing a monarch. Check the hind wings, make sure you're not seeing a viceroy. Now, this is the major life threat to the monarch. It is this life cycle of this parasite, which we're going to just call OE. And if the, the parasites overwhelm the caterpillar, it can die. Um, it can, the, the 
caterpillar may be strong enough to carry through to the pupal stage, but then it can die within the, the chrysalis. The chrysalis just turns black or the adult can emerge and um, you'll have an adult. Sometimes if the wings are crumpled, it's because again, um, it, the, the monarch will never be able to fly and it's because of the OE contamination. But it is assumed, believed that all monarchs have some degree of the OE on their bodies. The positive side effect of that is that in the Methuselah generation, that migrating generation, the heavily infected butterflies cannot manage that journey. Um, they're weaker. And so the monarchs that make it to the overwintering sites are the healthiest monarchs. Um, so that's positive. Now, the other thing that's happened, well, let me see, here are the, the scales of the butterfly and here is the OE. What I've just learned about um, is a program called, it's a, it's a citizen science project called Monarch RX. Monarch RX. And a German uh, scientist has noticed behavior in milkweed butterflies around the world, 30 years plus of study. And what happens and what has been observed is particularly in, in Maryland, where monarch butterflies would land on these dead plants and they'd be seen to be scratching the surface of the leaf. And then what they ended up doing would be absorbing some of the chemicals that are within these plants. And they either can brush those bits um, through the proboscis and um, if there's liquid there, if there's some liquid left in the plant, they will suck it up or they spit saliva on dry plant matter. And then they suck up the PA um, liquid with their proboscis. And what is suspected is that the monarchs are self-medicating and they are dealing with the OE that's in their bodies. So this is brand new research. Um, brand new couple of years, it's just coming to the forefront. And it's something that if you have a garden, um, you can check this out, see what's going on. And I know that Michael would love to hear from people. What are your observations? Maine milkweed, the four varieties. Um, and what we're blessed with is the common milkweed, which has that mid-level toxicity so it is what monarchs seek out. Um, so we're blessed in Maine with that. Um, let's see. Um, cardiac glycosides, cardinalides that are in the, the, the milkweed um, can cause illness. Uh, certainly if you get the, 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 uh, the milkweed near your eyes, the, the sap from your eyes, um, it can cause serious skin and eye inflammation. Um, so always wear gloves when you're dealing with milkweed. Um, and I already talked about the climate effects on toxin levels. This is the root system of a common milkweed, which is different from the other milkweeds. Um, and if you are interested in spreading milkweed, common milkweed on your property or whatever, collecting these root systems and planting them is a quick way to get more milkweed locally. According to research that was conduct conducted in the Midwest, the Latris family was one of the most visited plant plants by monarchs during the migration. So this year, I'm gonna be investigating this and experimenting on my own to see whether I'm attracting the monarchs. But again, this is based on research. 
There it is. Um, I've talked about this already. These are things that you can do to help. Um, being cautious. The one thing to stress on here is the become politically active, become aware in your area of how open areas are being treated and so forth. Plant the milkweed. They can, it can be done in a variety of locations and even a few plants make a difference. Um, if you're interested, getting involved with the tagging of the monarchs um, is, is an interesting activity to do and has long-term research effects. If you watch NOVA, you may have already seen it. If you haven't, please look up um, Butterfly Blueprints. Uh, it premiered in January. Um, the Scientific Secrets of Butterflies. It's a fascinating program. Monarch Joint Venture, monarchwatch.org. And I thank you, I'm done. Well, thank you, Serene. Um, does anybody have any questions? I think they were so busy watching, nobody typed in a question. <laughs> um, let me turn my camera back on there. Um, so I just, what, I'll ask a question on um, that citizen science project. Could you just quickly explain that again? I, I didn't, um, which, which, which one, the one about the OE. Okay. Or, yes. Yeah. What, what, um, if you go on to that site, which by the way, I can share the addresses with you so that if anybody's inquires, they'll be available. Um, what he is looking for is photographs of butterflies okay. doing that. Okay. And right. when, when that is shared, um, it is um, the location, the date, you know, what you observed. Okay. Yeah. And um, so since I asked a question, a bunch more came in. <laughs> um, so Kat, Kate asks, are you worried about solar farms and the impact on fields and milkweed? I haven't heard, I've, I've wondered about that myself, but I haven't heard anything. Um, and I think that's yet to be determined. Yeah. Milkweed, especially common milkweed, likes disturbed ground. So it, it will often find a, a, a new home with just again, it, the the descriptor is disturbed ground. So, um, hopefully, you know, milkweed will take root there, and and people will leave it alone. Okay, Barbara asks the special tree that grows in Mexico. Can that possibly be grown in other in the south? I guess I don't know what she means, but south of our United States, I guess. Well, it um, it is an endangered tree. There aren't many groves of the OML in Mexico itself, but what they require is this very high elevation. So um, it has very specific requirements. It's not an easily adaptable tree. Well, I have a follow-up on that. Would it, would the monarchs ever adapt to overwintering on a different species of tree? Is there any thoughts about well, that? The reason, part of the reason the monarchs go to where they go to, the what leads them there is in that volcanic ridge, there is a lot of iron. Mm -hmm. And in their antenna are receptors mm -hmm. that guide them. It's, it's, also, it's also sunlight that guides them to where they need to go. But they're going to that very specific area. Yeah. So you don't, I don't think there, we're going to find a way where you talk them into going somewhere else. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, Jane asked the question, how did you know the pics of the male and female butterflies were newly emergent? 
because they were so bright. Their colors were so bright. Um, and I think the one of the male was one that I took and I was, so I knew um, that it was fresh. But when you see the monarchs in Mexico, you often do see them, um, especially later in the season where they've been in amongst each other for so long that their wings bump and so forth. And their the scales um, can be uh, wiped off by various interactions and so forth. And they, um, you're not, you're asked not to remove any of the monarchs, even the dead ones um, when you're in the wintering sites. Um, but you can see there's such a difference between somebody that's fresh and green in Maine to somebody who's overwintered in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Um, so that was all the questions in the chat. Does anybody else have a question? You can unmute and ask your question. Or I don't see anybody. Well, I guess if you have any final thoughts, Serene, to encourage us what things we could do to help. I know you said plant some milkweed and take care of not mowing it all down, but is there anything else we could do? Check in with those organizations. Uh, Joint Venture has done a wonderful job of preparing informative material, a broad range of things, um, just as Monarch Watch has. Uh, Monarch Watch certainly promotes the tagging of monarchs um, because it is such a, um, important part of learning about the monarchs, where they're coming from, how they're, how they're surviving. Um, so check in those sites. Um, there's a wealth of information. Yeah. Yeah. Just educate yourself and yep. be an activist for the monarch. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, I don't see any other questions. Um, I really want to thank you. This was very, very, um, interesting and well put together and i'm sure it will be viewed many times on our youtube channel so thank you thank you all and i hope we can make a difference me too